Hi there, everyone. Here to talk to you about the judiciary. There's a couple of concepts that I want to uh, make clear to you, I hope. Um, and they have to do with the way that, that cases are decided um, at the Supreme Court, especially, um, and kind of some of the different approaches that judges can take toward deciding cases. Now, the, the Supreme Court, of course, is at the top of the entire federal judiciary. Um, and because of the supremacy clause, because of the power of the federal, federal government, um, they are the highest court in the land. Um, but there are federal courts below that. Um, there are district courts um, for each of the federal districts. Each of those districts has a, a, a U.S. attorney uh, that's a prosecutor. But for the courts, you've got a district court, federal district court. There are something like 95 of those uh, throughout the uh, country. Um, then you have the U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeals. Um, and I'll put up a map of this uh, in class on Thursday. But um, those Circuit Courts of Appeals hear cases that are appealed from the district courts. Above that is the Supreme Court, um, which mostly hears appeals, but also um, does hear some cases through original jurisdiction where the things go right there, the cases go right there. Okay, um, the court has um, become very important for a couple of reasons. One goes all the way back to 1803 with the Marbury versus Madison case. We read about this early on in uh, the American political history book, but this is where the Supreme Court declared that it did have the power of judicial review, okay, where in a sense, the court has the right to say that certain laws are unconstitutional uh, and therefore void. Um, so if, a, if a, a law is against the constitution because the constitution is a higher law than laws passed by the legislature, um, it voids those laws, okay? Now, uh, that was at one time controversial. It, there are still some criticisms of that, but that's uh, basically how it has worked ever since, okay? Um, that the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution and therefore uh, is that highest court of appeal within the nation. Um, if the Constitution is changed by amendment, then, of course, the Supreme Court would have to go along with that. But the Supreme Court is the last court of appeal about the uh, about judicial interpretation. Now, um, that is a uh, great power, of course, and how judges actually apply that power has become a matter of great controversy, um, partially because you see in the um, 20th century, roughly, and after, into our day, um, a view of judicial power and interpretation that says that uh, the court can, uh, can, sorry, uh, the court can um, sometimes say what the, the law should be, in a sense, um, that it should look at the Constitution and say, how does it apply for today? And what does it what does it mean today? Uh, how does it keep up with our, our values? And sort of interpret things in keeping with today's values as they would see it, or what they think today's values are or should be. Okay, um, that especially you see the court becoming more powerful in the mid nineteen fifth or the mid 20, 20th century, uh, the nineteen fifties and on, um, because at least arguably, you have what's called the emergence of the populist bureaucratic regime by Morton Keller, where the uh, courts become more powerful as, as people are appealing to the court to, uh, and courts in general, the Supreme Court specifically, to um, make rulings that change laws, okay, uh, and change the way the Constitution is interpreted. Um, some examples of this would be the uh, Brown versus Board of Education, which outlawed school segregation. Um, and 
the court found that the 14th Amendment would, the equal protection of the laws, um, should outlaw segregation at the, uh, in the schools. And that was something that courts didn't, the Supreme Court didn't say before, but said, no, no, that's, that's the right ruling. Um, more obviously something like the Miranda ruling where the court said, well, justice demands that the, um, police officers should read the Miranda rights to the suspect. You have the right to remain silent, et cetera, or recite the rights. I'm sure most police officers don't have to read that, but maybe they do. Um, so they don't accidentally leave something out. Um, another example would be the Gideon case, uh, where Gideon versus Wainwright, where the court ruled that states had to provide counsel. Okay. The, the, uh, amendment six amendment, I believe says that they, uh, Nobody can be denied counsel, but they say fairness demands that they have to provide counsel. Uh, 1973, the Roe versus Wade decision um, said that the uh, that abortion um, was had to be legal in many circumstances based on the right to privacy, which they believed was the majority of the justices believed was in, implicitly protecting the Constitution. An earlier view had had said that in um, the same thing applied to contraception bans that they couldn't contraception could not be banned or limited uh, to say married couples. So those are some examples of controversial cases of the court becoming more powerful. And there's kind of two different axes that you can think of um, where you can evaluate judicial approaches. One is judicial restraint versus judicial activism. Okay. Uh, judicial restraint is the idea that could be held by both liberal and conservative justices. But uh, ju judicial restraint means the court should be very careful before um, overruling a law passed by Congress. Okay. Um, court should respect the, um, the laws passed by Congress rather than being too quick to strike them down. More activist judicial approaches are more likely to do that in the name of fairness or justice, equality. Um, so that's a, approaches that can again be used by both liberals and conservatives, kind of a, a style and, and approach type of, of difference, okay? activism restraint. Um, the other main axis of interpretation here uh, and style of, of decision making uh, is what you might call um, living constitutionalism versus originalism. Okay. And there's a, a big spectrum in between, um, you know, the, the extremes probably get the most attention, but, um, the living constitution approach is where the justices self-consciously will say, yeah, that every generation has to apply and interpret the meaning of the constitution for its own time. Uh, and so this is an example of this you see in um, the Obergefell versus Hodges decision that I've given you some excerpts from uh, Justice Kennedy writing the opinion that uh, legalized gay marriage throughout the country uh, basically said, you know, liberty was defined early on, but it's something that each generation has to understand and knew what it means and then um, make that a reality in society. And, and if the laws weren't going to do that. Uh, Kennedy seemed to think that uh, that's something that a court should decree. Um, so that's an example of, of living constitutionalism. And Justice Kennedy was was not particularly, um, you know, one-sided. He was fairly moderate overall in his judicial opinions, or maybe kind of fell to both sides, made a lot of different people angry, I guess. Um, but um, that idea of the living constitution, constitution's interpretation must keep up with our society today. Um, and that has appeal for a lot of people because they don't want um, to sort of have to be fighting against the constitution with their, with contemporary values. On the other hand, there's also a criticism of that, that, you know, if we have a living constitution, as one of my friends has said, you know, we don't have a constitution because when, if the constitution can be interpreted to how we want it today, then uh, what actual limits does it impose on government? Um, and that's 
question as well. Um, and does it just mean that, well, the kind of values of today is that's who's interpreting it? Well, it's the judges. Are their values the values of today? Are they accurately able to see that? Right? That's a, a question for it too. Um, but, um, you know, of course, very few people would, would want to say, oh, well, you know, uh, Brown versus Board of Education um, today would, would something we wish hadn't been decided. So it's, it's uh, you know, something to think carefully about, not just dismiss, you know, living constitutionalism. I'm not a living constitutional person myself. I'm a more of an originalist. And let's talk about what that is. But uh, an originalist would say, what does the Constitution mean when it was originally written? What do the words, the sentences mean? Um, and then that ought to be applied to the questions of law today. Um, and it doesn't mean the Constitution can never change, but it means that if we want to change the Constitution, it ought to be through the established process of amendment. Um, and uh, like Justice Scalia, you know, I kind of think maybe the Constitution is a little too hard to amend. It should be made easier to amend, but there's a process that to be done. And it, it, um, originalists get concerned when justices um, are seen to be sort of uh, reinterpreting it for contemporary values as opposed to looking at what the actual text says. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, you could imagine that um, this, there could be some weaknesses to this approach too. For example, cruel and unusual punishment, okay, is a something that's forbidden by the Eighth Amendment. Um, this is just my my uh, example here. Perhaps, surely, legal scholars have had much more brilliant thoughts about this than me. But let's say we uh, there's something that was not forbidden by le the clause of cruel and unusual punishment uh, in 1780 or 1791 when this was ratified. Well. Okay, what if we today find out that it actually, by any definition, is cruel and unusual punishment, but wasn't thought to be then? It is a lot more painful, for example, than people then thought it was. Does that mean we have to allow it? Or if we, can we say, well, we now know it is, by any definition, cruel and unusual, and therefore uh, the Constitution prohibits it. Um, so there are uh, different approaches to understanding. There's middle ground too between living constitutionalism and um, originalism. Uh, but these are the kind of questions that uh, are kind of approaches you can see Supreme Court justices talk about here or write about. And just the final thing is with a, a polarization in our political system where Republicans and Democrats are farther apart than they have been, where you've got um, major cultural economic issues that um, seem hard to compromise on um, things like gun, gun control, gun rights, abortion restrictions, abortion rights, um, religious liberty issues, LGBT rights issues, all these kinds of things are pretty intense and uh, in their divides oftentimes. And so in that environment, courts often are the ones who make the decisions when it's hard for the legislature to do that. Um, and that is not necessarily the role that courts are, are supposed to play, but maybe it's the right role. You can, you can argue for that too. Uh, we'll talk more about this on Thursday and I hope you have a good day and a good week.